Well, greetings everyone. Today I've been given another opportunity to present this material in what will be our last study in cults and religions. Today I will be introducing you to neo-paganism and Wicca. But first, the first one we'll look at is uh, Norse paganism, then we'll be moving on to Greek paganism, then we'll go over Celtic paganism, and then finally we'll look at witchcraft or aka Wicca. My hope is that by the end of this, our, by the end of our time together, you will have become more familiar with the topic of neo-paganism and witchcraft, and that, and also what the Bible has to say about it. But before we do this, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to share what I have learned about neo-paganism and Wicca. I pray that you could use this lecture as a means of equipping the saints that you could uh, show us the lies of Satan for what they are and that we would not be fooled by them. And that through this lecture, we would be reminded of your truths and embrace them. That we, would be no that we would be grateful for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, and be better equipped to share the gospel with the people we come in contact with in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. But before we get into the meat here, I'd just like to take some time to review why we should even bother looking into the darkness, so to speak, looking at paganism and witchcraft. Why should we as believers learn about cults and religions? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 15, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But by speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, that is Christ. It also says in the scriptures in Colossians 2.8 that we should beware lest anyone cheat us through philosophy, through empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Thus, God has given us a warning. He has given us a good reason to become at least a little bit familiar with these different belief systems. Namely, he does not want us to be deceived. These studies, therefore, are an attempt, they're an effort to bring to our awareness some of the deceitful doctrines that are not just tolerated in our culture today, but celebrated and promoted. The desired result, again, being that we would be better equipped to identify worldly thinking and idolatry of our culture and to avoid it. We have another reason to become familiar with cults and religions found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 where God says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove. Teaching. But, if you think that passage was just for the pastor, here's one for all of us. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, God says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We see then that God not only wants us to avoid deception, he wants us to become familiar so that we don't fall for these lies, but he also wants us to be more prepared in our evangelistic efforts. He wants us to be able to reason with the unsaved with meekness and fear. Interesting word choice, meekness and fear. The word meekness carries the idea of consideration or being considerate to another person. The word fear could be translated respect. And what better way to show consideration and respect than by taking some time to understand, at least in general, the person that you're trying to share the gospel with? Who are they? Where are they from? What do they believe? It's good and right that we take careful measures to understand the Bible in context. But it's also important that we take some time to understand the person in context, lest we find ourselves speaking to ourselves. Thus, it's worthwhile for us to become familiar with neo-paganism because God does not want us to be deceived by the doctrines and philosophies of it. It's worthwhile for us because God has called us to be ambassadors to the neo-pagan, to share the hope of eternal life with them in a considerate and respectful way. With that in mind, let's take a look at neo-paganism. 
The man that you see here on the screen is Mr. Aleister Crowley, probably one of the most notable icons of neo-paganism. He was born October 12, 1875 and died December 1, 1947. He was an English occultist. He was a philosopher, a ceremonial magician, a poet, a painter, a novelist, and a mountaineer. He was born into a family of the Plymouth Brethren, but later rejected his faith. Interestingly, his mother referred to him as the beast, not a beast, but the beast of Revelation. And so, in a sad way, he became a kind of self-fulfilled prophecy. Even the secular news outlets of his day considered him to be the most evil man on the planet. <clears throat> he had become a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which studied all things mystical, mythical, and magical. He joined a variety of other secret, society, secret societies in pursuit of secret wisdom. He found his own religion called Thelema, in which there was only one rule, namely, do as thou wilt. One might ask at the outset here, why do people fall for this stuff? Why do people get sucked into the darkness? The answer, I believe, is at least hinted at in John 3, verses 19 through 21, which reads, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and that men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be, may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. In other words, we humans are broken. There's something fundamentally wrong with us. We're lovers of darkness. Now, I want to throw out a disclaimer here. The information that I'm about to share with you is by no means exhaustive. It is my honest attempt to introduce you to these different belief systems. And with that in mind, I want to define some terms for you. Then I'm going to use these terms as a framework to understand neo-paganism broadly. At the end, I hope to show you from the Word of God that neo-paganism and Wicca are condemned in Scripture as sin, and therefore we should avoid them as such. Here's one of the first terms, polytheism polytheism. This comes from the Greek language, poly meaning many and theos meaning God. So polytheism means many gods. Polytheism is the belief that there is more than one God. Indeed, there are many gods with various strengths and capabilities. In polytheism, there is no ultimate being above all others. However, there are gods that outrank lesser gods, either by birth or by power, or by conquest. It would be impossible for any person to worship all the gods of a polytheistic religion. And so, if you will find a polytheist choosing one or two gods of the pantheon, a pantheon being the collection of the gods, but uh, a polytheist would choose one or two of these gods to worship and serve. The god of choice is determined by family tradition, by personal preference, or on a purely pragmatic purpose, meaning that they worship the God for what they could get out of it. This is polytheism. Moving on then to pantheism. Pantheism, again coming from the Greek, pan meaning all and theos meaning God. Pantheism is the belief that the universe is God. It is the belief that all is one, much like Hinduism or Buddhism. Hence, the earth is God, the stars are God, the moon and the sun are God, the mountains and the lakes are God, and so on, all the way down to the bugs and the viruses. Therefore, you may find that a witch or a neo-pagan themselves might claim to be God because they are part of the universe. They might even claim that you are God because you're part of the universe. This is pantheism. God is the universe and all is one. Moving on from that, we have panentheism. Sounds similar to pantheism. 
It does come from the Greek, pan meaning all, but the word en means in and theos at the end. So we have all in God is what panthe panentheism is. Panentheism is the belief that God and the universe are distinct. The universe is inside of God, and because of this, God interpenetrates the whole of the universe, almost as if God were pregnant with the universe. And if you try to picture in your mind like a sponge being thrown into the ocean, and the ocean completely gets sucked up into the sponge, it's not the sponge, but it is infecting the sponge, if you will, permeating the sponge, but they're yet distinct. And that's kind of a picture of panentheism, the universe being the sponge and God being the ocean. I have a picture here to show you the difference. So <clears throat> the first sphere there on the, um, on the right is God equals the universe in contrast, so that the first one is pantheism, but panentheism believes that the universe is inside of God and God permeates or interpenetrates uh, all of the universe. That's panentheism. Another term here is animism. Animism is the belief that the physical world is inhabited by innumerable, innumerable amount of spiritual beings or unseen entities that affect and determine the everyday affairs of life. The goal of an animist is to live at harmony with nature, with even the rocks and the trees, because they would not want to upset or interfere with the natural order of things. That's animism. There we have shamanism. Thus far, we've been talking about the foundational terms related to the kind of the what of paganism, but now we'll briefly look at this word shamanism as a kind of how to do paganism and how they do their religion. Again, this is a concept or a term that came up regularly, and I, I bring it up now as a means of study to show you the practical outcome of believing in paganism and uh, panentheism or animism. That outcome being what I'm calling shamanism. Here's a quote on shamanism, a uh, definition from an encyclopedia. Shaman, a shaman is an umbrella term used by anthropologists to describe a vast collection of practices and beliefs, many of which do, uh, uh, many of which have to do with divination, spirit communication, and magic. And in essence, that's how I'm using the term shaman in this study, as an umbrella term over the titles or offices that you would find in different neo-pagan or witchcraft uh, uh, Wiccan religions. Terms like witch, warlock, sorcerer, doctor, priest, priestess, or druid. So shamanism is the belief in an unseen world of gods or spirits which can be influenced or manipulated through shamanistic practices like divination, sorcery, or other occult practices. There is, however, one notable difference uh, between a shaman and, say, a druid. Uh, if you were studying a certain form of paganism and they actually had somebody in that religion that was wore the title as shaman versus in the Celtic religion, a druid. So an actual shaman in that culture, if they wore that title, a true shaman, if you will, is chosen by, and this is sad, uh, but it's worth noting, a true shaman is chosen by a demon or a group of evil spirits among, at, from a young age is often tortured by those spirits and left with physical or uh, some kind of physical defect or limitation. Their resistance to the demon must be completely broken before they can become a mouthpiece for that evil spirit. Druids, on the other hand, in contrast to someone who might wear the actual title of shaman, a druid, on the other hand, has to study for some 20 years before they can claim that title, their powers are developed through much study, memorization, and practice. In the end, however, um, when they try to live out their paganism, they practice such things as sorcery, divination, and other uh, forms of witchcraft or uh, sorcery. Another term here is relativism. The final term for the framework that we're going to use to look at these different religions is relativism. I believe rel relativism is the practical result of polytheism, of pantheism and animism, 
Relativism says that there is no absolute truth, no absolute right and wrong. It says that morality exists only in relationship to a person's cultural or social norms. Well, why do I say that these beliefs ultimately lead to relativism? Because there's no ultimate authority in any of these religions. Right and wrong is subject to the gods or goddesses that you have chosen to worship based upon your own subjective desires to serve them, whether that be tradition or preference or whatever pragmatic purpose you might have. Morality fluctuates along with the ebb and flow of the supernatural ethos mysteriously working behind the scenes. So there is no absolute truth. This is another reason why I think neo-paganism has become more and more popular in our day. Because ultimately, the moral authority is the practitioner, not the God that they claim to serve or worship. The practitioner decides which God even to believe in. And the practitioner decides how that God will be characterized and what they're like. And the practitioner, most importantly, gets to decide how their gods are served. And so neo-paganism is a kind of religious buffet table. Each individual pagan is an eclectic mix of their own religious beliefs and practices based upon their unique spiritual taste buds. And take a moment here just to define the term neo-paganism. We've gone through all those other terms that we're going to use as a framework. But here, just looking at the term neo-paganism, what does that mean? The word pagan originally uh, came from the Latin word uh, paganus. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. But it meant villager or rustic. And in a, der in a derogatory sense, it meant something like our modern equivalent of redneck or hillbilly or country bumpkin. In the 4th century, after Rome's adoption of Christianity, the term was used to refer to followers of non-Abrahamic religions, meaning if you weren't a Muslim, if you weren't a Jew, if you weren't a Christian, then you were a pagan. The word neo means to revive or to be new, and that's what neo-pagans are doing. They're trying to revive these pre-Christian uh, religions. Thus, neo-paganism is a, a family of new religions that find their roots in extinct pre-Christian religions of Europe, North Africa, and West Asia. Neo-paganism is the modern-day approach, as I said, to revive these beliefs and practices. Some try to emulate pre-Christian traditions with precision and accuracy, while the majority of neo-pagans openly build their own understanding and practices. Another term uh, that is used to describe neo-paganism is heathen heathen Dumb. Heathendom, this is a, a synonym, if you will, of neopaganism. You might hear that word uh, being used to describe what we're talking about today. Moving on then to the first neopagan religion. The first neopagan belief system we'll look at is the Norse and or Germanic pagan paganism. These are the re revived beliefs and practices held by ancient Scaven Scandinavian or Saxon peoples. I have a quote here from World Religions and Cults, uh, about one of the books I read for this presentation. <clears throat> he says there that the Norse Germanic mythologies paint a confusing and magic dominated hodgepodge of human gods, goddesses, giants, elves, and other and others, some of whom even change their form into another. How do we get influenced? You'll find that all of these different religions find their way into our lives, mostly through art, entertainment, Hollywood movies like Marvel, comic books. Video games are a big inroad where you can actually pretend that you're one of these uh, ain't a follower of one of these ancient religions. YouTube, obviously, and TikTok. So, again, using these terms as a framework, let's look at how a Norse mythology is polytheistic. They believed in many gods. Uh, some of the most popular gods in Norse mythology would be Odin or Woden. Odin was the king of Asgard, the lord of all the gods. And this was through divine conquest. 
He destroyed his enemies and even the giant frost, the frost giant, Ymir. I'll talk about him a little bit more later. But Odin was worshipped as an expert in wisdom, magic, and poetry. The word Wednesday that we use uh, in our weekly calendar, if you were going to drill down and find out where that word came from, uh, it found its origin in Woden or Woden's Day. Similar, Thursday comes from his son, Thor, Thor's Day. So we have the, he, Thor, the god of thunder. Again, if you've seen any of the recent Marvel movies, this should be fresh in your mind, but Thor was the divine protector god, the thunder god, the god of thunder and lightning. He was Odin's son. Next we have uh, less popular, didn't find their way into any Marvel movies yet that I know of, was Frey and Freya, but they were very popular in uh, ancient paganism. Uh, they're a brother and sisters, and they were uh, gods of fertility and prosperity. And then, so they would be used by those pagans to, uh, when harvest time came in, or if they had a certain thing that they wanted to accomplish, or wanted to have a, a big family, they would be uh, serving and worshiping these gods. And this is actually, again, like Woden's Day or Thor's Day. We have Friday comes from these two. <clears throat> Not so nice as the brother and sister team that we just talked about. We have this father and daughter. We have Loki here. Loki was the god of mischief. He was actually a bisexual shapeshifter. He had the ability to, shape, uh, to change shape and cause all kinds of mischief and trouble. His daughter, Hel or Hela, was actually the ruler of the underworld. And the uh, neo-pagans are attracted to these attracted to this these characters as we said in John chapter 3 attracted to the darkness moving on so we've said that Norse Germ uh, Germanic mythology uh, was was polytheistic they're also animistic that is to say um, these Vikings and Saxons believed that volcanoes and glaciers and rocks all had spirits associated with them these elements and natural formations could actually think and act. And so they were animistic. Some modern terms that people use to uh, describe their neo-paganism might be Odinism or Wotanism or Asatru. Uh, so if, and on here on the screen there, that's Thor's hammer. I recently was at a customer's home working on uh, some drywall and uh, the man there answered the door, and he was wearing one of these, Thor, uh, Thor's hammer. And his daughter's middle name actually was... Um, well, you'll, you'll see when I get to uh, the Celtic religions, if I remember. <clears throat> Essentially, though, these are the new terms that they would go by. Neopaganism uh, in Germanic or Norse mythology was shamanistic in practice as I'm using the term. There were these uh, people inside of the, the religious system called the Volva, which, perf uh, which performed Seder. Not like the Jewish Seder, but a different kind of Seder altogether. Essentially, it was uh, divination. They would travel the spirit, the spirit realm, and foretell when they would come back, they would foretell the future and uh, proclaim a blessing or a curse. There were also the uh, totemistic warriors. They have, would have totems. As you think of like a, maybe a totem pole, if you're familiar with that. They were also known as berserkers who would consume different kinds of uh, herbs or mushrooms, uh, go into battle, oftentimes in the nude, do battle. And some even, uh, it is claimed, were able to take on the spirit of their totem animal, become possessed by the spirit of their totem animal, and even shapeshift into that animal. Odin, Odin himself was famous uh, also for being a kind of shaman, going on spiritual journeys to gain more wisdom and insight into the universe. What about their creation myths? Um, well, Revelation. Uh, the, sor the main sources that we have of Norse mythology are the Prowls and the Poetic Edas. These literary, literary works 
were written down in Iceland during the 13th century. Their creation story, as you see up here, is uh, the map of, uh, of the tree which holds the nine realms together. But their creation story is thus, originally there were two worlds of fire and ice. When these two worlds met, the melting created the frost giant Ymir, and also a cosmic cow, strangely enough. Ymir lived off the cow's milk, and the cow lived off the ice. The cow created the first gods by licking the ice. Odin and his brothers were the offspring of these gods and giants. They ultimately went to war with the giants. The death of the original giant, Ymir, caused a great flood that killed all the other giants, but one escaped on a boat. That's an interesting kind of head nod to the, uh, the biblical account. Then Odin and the gods created Isengard and created the humans out of trees and breathed into them the breath of life. Interesting. The whole universe is connected, ultimately, as, I see, as you see here in the picture, by a giant tree. Um, what do they think about sin? There's no clear idea of sin apart from loose moral codes based on loyalty, honor, and work, courage, and integrity. They are loose because they are, there is no absolute supreme God overall. <coughs> Thus, morality is unstable as the God's personalities are unstable. Salvation. What do they believe about salvation? This view on... What are their views on the afterlife? They vary, but in general, if you are a warrior and die valiant, valiantly in battle, you get to go to their version of heaven, which is Valhalla, and everyone else goes to Helheim, uh, that's where Hela is in control. But in the end, Valhalla, the soldiers of Valhalla of heaven, and the soldiers of Helheim go to war in an epic battle called Ragnarok. So who knows what happens after that? All right. So that was neo-paganism with regards to Norse and Germanic mythology. Moving on then to Greek and Roman The, the Greek, Greek and Roman neo-paganism, these were the beliefs uh, that are being revived, which were held by the Greeks and the Romans of old. Again, here's another quote uh, describing this uh, version of neo-paganism. Various deities governed, governed the natural forces of the world from the sky to the sea to the vegetation to earthquakes and marriage. They were powerful but quarrelsome and seemed to lack self-control and wisdom. So that's the description from this uh, expert on, on the topic, uh, describing the gods of this neo-pagan religion. They were quarrelsome and seemed to have a lack of self-control. Again, how do we get influenced by these belief systems today? It's through art, entertainment, movies, comic books, video games, etc. Here's a head nod from um, uh, the, the modern uh, scientific, if you will, um, green movement. The Gaia hypothesis. Let me just read this to you. All living things on Earth, in, that is the biosphere, function as one superorganism that changes its environment to create conditions that best meet its needs with the ability to self regulate critical systems needed to sustain life. Although um, Greek and Romans were not truly animistic. They did have certain gods called primordial gods, which in essence acted in a similar way. That is, they believed in Gaia as a primordial god, the god of earth. And they believed in Eros, which is uh, considered to be love, and Tartarus as a place, not just a place, but an actual god of some kind. So they had this kind of animistic uh, nuance to their beliefs. Again, I just read the Gaia Hypothesis. So you can see, again, how the beliefs of the Greeks and the Romans still influence us today through this hypothesis, saying that the world itself is actually um, a superorganism that can change its environment. The Greeks and the Romans were polytheists. Uh, they had the primordial gods, but they also had the Titans and the Olympians. The Titans came before the Olympians. Some of the more famous Titans are Atlas, Prometheus, and Epi Epimetheus. Then you had the 
Olympians like Zeus, Artemis, and Apollo. Modern-day term here to describe this version of neo-paganism would be Hellenismos. Uh, many of them would probably just call themselves Hellenistic neo-pagans. Uh, they did not have shamans per se, but they did have Greek, uh, they had priests and priestesses. Greeks and Romans had their share of witches and diviners, for sure, but the majority of their religious beliefs and practices were pro propagated and maintained by the priests dedicated to their specific God. The revelation, how do we know what they believed? They didn't have any sacred texts that were handed down to them from God, but most of what we understand about uh, these religions came from sources like Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey and other books of that time period. Let's look at their creation, their creation story. According to Greek mythology, out of chaos came darkness and, and night, which were again a primordial gods. These primordial gods fell in love, Eros, and gave birth to light and day. Interesting how darkness and night fell in love and gave birth to light and day. Then came these other uh, primordial gods like Gaia and Oronos, which is the sky. The Titans and the Olympians ultimately came along through this kind of convoluted cosmic family tree. Then there was a war between the Titans and the Olympians. Prometheus and Epimetheus uh, betrayed the Titans by joining the Olympians in the battle, and the Titans unfortunately lost the war. Prometheus and Epimetheus were rewarded by Zeus with an opportunity to create something for themselves. Epi uh, Epimetheus created the animals and the world of plants, etc., but Prometheus was given the opportunity to create humans out of clay. Prometheus also gave humans the power over fire, which made Zeus mad. So he punished mankind with womankind. Namely, he gave uh, humans Pandora, and she had a, as you might know the story, she had a box, and when she, un when she opened, the, when Pandora opened the box, she unleashed all the evils of the world. That's their creation of humanity. That's their version of where we came from and why and what's wrong with us. What do they believe about sin? Uh, it's poorly defined and often associated, again, with offending various gods and their personalities, which makes it almost impossible to know uh, what's right and wrong due to the different opinions or desires of the god in any given moment. Salvation. If you made the gods mad, you would probably end up in Tartarus. Uh, if you went unnoticed, you would end up in a, kind of a boring meadow, in Hades. But if you did something uncommonly great, you might actually end up in Elysium, which was their version of heaven. So that was the uh, Greek and Roman mythology, and that's what the neo-pagans of our day that are trying to revive those belief systems, those beliefs. Moving on to the Druid and Celtic beliefs, the Druid and Celtic flavor of neo-paganism. These were the beliefs and practices typically associated with the cults of Northern Europe. And here's a quote from World Religions and Cults. Druidism was an ancient religious faith found in Gaul and later in England and Ireland as the Romans pushed northward. The term Druid derives from the old Welsh term for oak, implying that they are the people who know the wisdom of the trees. How are we influenced by these belief systems today broadly in our culture? It's through art, entertainment, Hollywood, movies, comic books, YouTube, and TikTok. The Druids were definitely animistic in their thinking. They believed in, in all all non-human natural forces like plants and animals, the weather and the elements had supernatural forces at work in them. And they sought to manipulate these forces, to live with them in harmony, but also to manipulate them uh, to their own ends. They were animistic. They were also, also polytheistic. Um, the, their, the, the father god here, Dagda, 
That's the guy on the far right. Um, he was called the good God, the father God of Ireland, God of fertility, agriculture, the seasons, weather, wisdom, magic, and the Druids had a special liking for him. He was known to be cheerful and good-natured. And then his wife, or consort, was Morgian, or excuse me, yeah, Mori, Morrigan. Uh, she was also had some other titles, the Triple Goddess. Uh, she was a god of fate, destiny, and protection. Some of those other titles she had was the Phantom Queen, the Queen of Demons. She was a shapeshifter who took on the form often of a crow or a raven. Then we have Kernunas. That's the horned god here. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Kernunas, uh, the horned god of the forest, animals, and vegetation. He had antlers like a... Uh, and so and, and, and this is one of the only gods in Druidism that had kind of like a animal mixed with a human. And so they believe that it was probably proto-Celtic god, that one of the first Celtic gods. He's known as the god of the hunt, associated with the Roman god Death, or Hades. There's an important god in Wicca and witchcraft who is celebrated on uh, Samhain, which is uh, a Wiccan term for Halloween. Some modern variations. So if you were going to bump into somebody they have held to these beliefs, they would maybe call themselves a Druid, or they might call themselves a Celtic Neo-Pagan. Inside of their beliefs, uh, they had the Druids and the Ovates. The Druids were the elite priestly class of ancient Celtic cultures. They were both religious and legal authorities. They were scribes, doctors, and advisors. Important people in their community. The Ovates were more like the uh, diviners, the, sh the shamans. Uh, they spoke to the dead. They made prophecies of the future, and, and so on. What about Revelation? There's no sacred text for the Celtic religion or traditions that I know of. Um, the beliefs and practices were handed down through families and Druids. Though they were literate, it was forbidden for the Druids themselves to write anything down. It was all passed down through memorization. And as I said earlier, it took some 20 years for them to become a Druid, according, according to Julius Caesar, who made some remarks on them. Uh, so all that we know about them comes from the historians of the ancient uh, times, like the Roman historians and Catholic monks. Uh, what do they believe about creation? I did find one creation account, which was so uh, grotesque, I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> I guess I did mention it, but... And as I studied it further, there was more evidence that they didn't really uh, have a, a, an authoritative explanation of where we came from. Most, I shouldn't say most, but many Druids of today wouldn't worry about it too much and it would actually uh, claim to hold to the view of evo the evolutionary ideas of the Big Bang. What do they believe about sin? There's no standard of right and wrong, according to the Druid. Morality is relative to the virtues like honor, loyalty, justice, and courage. Some hold to the view of karma. That is to say, they don't want to do wrong because they're afraid what they do might come back and get them. I say there's no absolute standard because, again, there's no absolute authority. There's no absolute God over all that has, had, that has said to them, Thus saith the Lord. They're figuring it out as they go and worshiping these gods based upon their own interpretation. Salvation. <clears throat> Salvation is through a process uh, of reincarnation, acquiring special knowledge and individuals learn to be united with the ultimate source. So these druids uh, sound very similar to be on a spiritual quest like uh, that of the Buddhist or the Hindu, which is an interesting observation. Behind all of these false religions ultimately is working Satan and his lies. And so it's in, 
It's not surprising to find a, a theme there. Moving on to Wicca, or modern-day witchcraft. Wicca is a modern term used to describe uh, the religion of witchcraft. The neo-pagan beliefs and practices here are most popular. Most, to be a witch is most popular in the United States, Europe, and Australia. Influencers of today, again, would be entertainment, Hollywood, movies, comic books, video games, cartoons even, TikTok, etc. Some witches are atheistic or agnostic, so they don't have a theory of where we've come from outside of what they learned in public school, that we came uh, out of nothing, and the evolutionary theories of Darwin. But that's not all witches. Some witches are uh, pantheistic. Many of them believe in the mother goddess, or the Gaia, like we find in Greek mythology, that the universe and, uh, or, oh, excuse me, uh, yeah, some of them believe in pantheism that the goddess and the universe are one. Therefore, witches may see themselves as a manifestation of the goddess. So if you were to walk up to a, a modern-day witch, she might see herself as a manifestation of a goddess. Another form of, or excuse me, but uh, some witches are atheists, some are pan, pantheists, some are panentheists, panentheists, that is to say that they believe that the goddess is transcendent above the universe, but also pervades the universe or interpenetrates the universe. Uh, if they don't believe in that, then some of them are polytheists. Uh, I think witchcraft, out of all these so far, is the most eclectic bunch. It's really the uh, build-your-own version of your spirituality. Some of them believe in multiple gods and goddesses. Some of them believe in multiple gods and goddesses that are ultimately a manifestation of the one true goddess. That being said, there are a good number of uh, witches, or those that are involved in witchcraft, you may call themselves Wiccans, that believe in duotheism, which uh, says that there is ultimately, ultimately two gods, known as the Lord and the Lady. The Lady being the Mother Goddess, and the uh, Lord being the Horned God, that we learned about in Celtic religion. The goddess, a.k.a. the lady, a.k.a. the great mother or the queen of heaven or the triple goddess, she manifests herself in three phases, the virgin, the mother, and the crone. It cannot be overstated that modern-day Wicca is a, as a belief system is overwhelmingly matriarchal. And there are some versions of Wicca that are so matriarchal that they would not allow you to join their coven if you were a man. They would only, uh, only allow you to join their coven if they were a woman. And that's a Dianic witchcraft. Uh, and it's actually very uh, political and activate, uh, activist, activistic. <laughs> They're very active in the political scene trying to promote uh, women's rights. And... It's, I think, ultimately a reaction against uh, the patriarchal system. So they, they would not like the idea of a father god and, they're not, and having no mother god. So they might have a, a bad taste in their mouth as we try to express our Christianity to them. The mother goddess focuses... Uh, the mother god focus has created, a, as I said, a, fem a feministic religion for many who practice witchcraft. The horned god, though, a.k.a. the lord, or the oak king, or the holly king, not holy king, but holly king, kind of like Hollywood, the holly king, is associated sometimes with Pan, and even sometimes with Satan, but they wouldn't call him Satan, they would call him Lucifer, and they wouldn't say it was the Lucifer of the Bible, it's a different kind of Lucifer, a good, an angel, or excuse me, a god of light, they wouldn't call him an angel, but he would, uh, is associated with Lucifer, and would worship him. There are different variations of Wicca. Because Wicca, as I stated, is a kind of build your own beliefs and practices, this type of religion, there are endless varieties of witches. 
Um, I even uh, saw a large list of different kinds of witches. There could be a, a, a white witch, a black witch, a green witch, a kitchen witch, a garden witch. Um, and they see these all as positive terms, but different categories, uh, different focuses um, in their belief system. There are, however, some organized groups which call themselves covens, and I just mentioned that with the Dianic coven. There's also the uh, uh, Gardarian coven, and then there's the Alexandrian coven. And these are different groups, small groups of witches and, uh, or Wiccans, male and female, or sometimes just female, that get together and practice witchcraft. Witches and warlocks in general. There is no hierarchy in Wicca. Each practitioner is an autonomy, an authority, to do, as their, to do as they wish. So each practitioner has their own autonomy and authority to do as he or she wishes. They engage in a plethora of occultic practices like divination, such as examples of that would be reading tarot cards, runes, um, runes where they would throw like the bones on the ground and look at that. They would read palms, spell casting, scrying. Scrying is a practice that witches do where they would look into uh, water or a crystal ball or a fire. One of the reasons that they like candles. Um, and, and be able to see different things into these elements, trying to foretell the future or get insights. They also, oddly enough, if you went out to, to have coffee with a witch, they might be able to use tessography, I think I'm saying that right, where essentially they could read, they could divine things uh, by the leftover uh, grounds of the coffee or the leftover uh, parts of the tea in the bottom of the cup. They also use pendulums. Uh, they essentially hang a weight at the end of a string and almost like a Ouija board uh, are able to make predictions using pendulums. They cast spells for their little problems uh, and with potions and incantations and symbols and so forth. But with their, if they want to do something really big, then they have to perform rituals, uh, which would include special locations, multiple people, and bigger sacrifices, etc. What are some of the tools of the trade for a witch? Uh, Wiccan tools of the craft are herbs, candles, crystals, essential oils, a special dagger, uh, wands even. Uh, they would use uh, chalices to hold different liquids. Some of them use pentagrams. I mean, they definitely use pentagrams and pentacles. There is a difference between a pentagram and a pentacle. So a, a pentagram is a five-pointed star with the main point being pointed down and two points up. That would be in, uh, used for more nefarious purposes. Uh, whereas a pentacle is considered to be a good, used for good. That would be a five-pointed star with the, um, the main point being up and then the two points down. They have all kinds of different uh, symbols and, and different practices that they do. Very diverse. What do they believe about Revelation? The, there is a book, probably the most famous book, uh, Gerald Gardner, who founded the Ger Gerardian Coven, excuse me. <clears throat> he comprised a book called The Book of Shadows. And uh, there's other books that are out there, but that's probably the most famous uh, with that being said, each witch is encouraged to create their own kind of book of shadows, almost like a spiritual journal or recipe book, if you will, or a scrapbook, where they are essentially uh, making their own version of witchcraft, building on what they've learned from others and found for themselves. Creation. <clears throat> As the rest of Wiccan beliefs and practices, the Wiccan view on creation varies. They may adopt some other view, uh, as we've just talked about, with regards to uh, the Norse mythology or Greek mythology or Celtic mythology. Or they might just be uh, holding to uh, Darwinian evolution, the Big Bang Theory. Wiccans are most concerned about the present 
and this life, and they're not so concerned about the past. What about sin? Wiccans believe that the practitioner is the ultimate rule and authority of their own life and experience. Much emphasis is placed on personal experience rather than logic or truth. In general, however, witches believe in polarity, which is kind of like Taoism. If you've seen the yin-yang symbol, that is, there's evil and there's dark, and the, uh, or if you've watched uh, Star Wars, there's the force, there's the light side and the dark side, and these two forces working behind the scenes have to stay in balance, and they can kind of morph into each other. And so ultimately there is no right and wrong in Star Wars or in witchcraft, but there is polarity. There is a dark side and a light side that must stay in balance. Some witches also believe in the rule of three, which is a form of karma, where they, uh, they again, they don't want to do wrong to other people because they feel that it will come back on them threefold. What do they believe about salvation? Witches see life as a cyclical, similar to Hinduism. They believe in a form of reincarnation, but for a witch, uh, unlike Hinduism, they're not trying to escape the cycle of, of reincarnation, but see reincarnation as an opportunity, and they embrace it as a gift from the mother goddess. However, some believe in a place called Summerland, not Slumberland, but Summerland, where the dead are reunited with loved ones in a, in a place of enlightenment. Witches see death as a natural part of life and death, even an opportunity for personal development given the right frame of mind. There is no threat of punishment or destruction. So, what binds these neo-pagans together? Because it's an eclectic bunch, right? They believe a lot of different things. They would disagree with each other on a lot of different topics or nuances of their beliefs. But what is it that binds them together? I believe what binds them together is their autonomy. That is the lie of Genesis 3. The neo-pagan wants to be free from moral constraints and religious authority. They want to be in control. The neo-pagan wants power and control. They want to believe that they can have control over their destiny and influence the outcome of the events of their lives by harnessing the powers of the natural or supernatural world. Again, this is the lie of Genesis 3. Let me just read that for you. And the woman said to the serpent, we may, eat of the tree of, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Here is the lie of autonomy. Here is the lie of power and control. Eat of the fruit and you won't need God anymore. Eat of the fruit and you can make your own rules. What else binds them together? They love nature. Neo-pagans have a profound love and respect for nature. They seek to honor nature with the way that they live their lives. They also, unfortunately, have kind of a disdain for Christianity, or at least the religious systems that they've experienced that wore the title of Christianity or uh, the name of Christ. Neo-pagans, like atheists, seem to have a kind of bitterness or disdain for what they perceive to be, quote-unquote, Christianity. Why is this? Romans chapter 1, verse 25 says, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So as these neo-pagans and witches go out there and they are, get a sense of awe as they look at nature or the night sky, instead of worshiping the creator of those things, they've, worshiped, they've decided to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, speaking of uh, how the Christian is uh, understood by the world, Paul states, Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us he diffuses a fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So when the Christian goes around, he's diffusing a kind of fragrance to the world. For we are to God a fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. 
to the one we are an aroma of death leading to death, and to the other an aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? So in essence, unfortunately, when we preach the truth or our representative of Jesus Christ in this world to those who are going to be saved, those who are going to come to the truth, we are a fragrance of life leading to life. But to those who are in love with the darkness, we are a fragrance of death. And so when we come and speak to many a neo-pagan or witch, this is what they see. And I have the slide here of a dead fish saying, Jesus loves you. But what they hear is something different. So we need to pray for the neo-pagan and the witch that their hearts would be opened to biblical truth. What about the biblical response to neo-paganism in Wicca? What's the biblical response? Well, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Baal? Or what part has the believer with the unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. What does the Bible say about animism? The belief in animism is a deception because we know that there, we know what's really, there's only really two forces at work in the world. The forces of evil led by Satan and the forces of good led by the kingdom, by, by God. So, specifically, what does the Bible say about animism? That which is good in this world is from God. Romans 1.20 And also, if you take the time, and I would encourage you to do that, we're not going to have time to look at these, but Psalm 104 and Psalm 19 give a great description of how God is at work, even in this fallen world, how he is the creator, how he's the provider and sustainer of this world. And all of the good things that we see in this world are a product of God's grace and his work. We also know that <clears throat> um, that which is sinful in this world is because of the fall. Remember we read in Genesis 3 uh, how Eve was tempted by Satan, but the result of that was the fall and the curse. And so we live in the ruins of a once much greater place. And so this world is broken. The weather, the uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, the system of the world has been cursed. Death has been brought into the world because of sin. That which is unfortunate in this world is because of God's judgment. And I list here Exodus 7, which is again just another example that God is at work in this world uh, in a good way. All things that are good are from God. But there are times when he stepped into human history and he has used the natural realm to punish or wake up the unbelieving. And that's a good picture in Exodus 7 where God actually curses uh, Egypt, the Egyptians with, this, uh, with the ten plagues, showing that he is greater than those false gods. Also we know, according to Job 1 and 2, that God does allow Satan and his demons some uh, leash, a, a measure... He uses what they intend for evil for good. In Job chapter 1 and 2, we read about how Satan actually is there and God uh, uh, allows Satan to unleash some of his evil on Job. And God uses that to bring about a, a greater good in the life of Job. And even the story of the cross, as we see how Satan attacked the very Son of God and sought to kill him and destroy him, how God used that evil the evil of Satan and his demons, to bring about a greater good, to bring about salvation to all humanity. And that's how we know animism is wrong, because of what the Bible tells us about what's really going on behind the scenes in this universe. What about polytheism? What does the Bible teach about polytheism? Well, we know from the Bible that there's really only one God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 in the Shema, where it says there is only one God, and that's the God that we should be serving. Also, in Exodus 20, in the Ten Commandments, we learn that we're, there's one God, and he's the alone should be worshipped. God alone is the one to be worshipped. We also read in Deuteronomy, again, to hope you can look these up for yourselves and see from the scriptures, that the little gods, 
that are, aren't gods at all, but behind these false gods or idols, you're actually worshiping demons. And this is why we should reject witchcraft and paganism, because it's idolatry. It's the worship of demons. And this is why we need to share the gospel with neo-pagans and witches, so that they could be saved out of this deceitful system. What does the Bible say about panentheism? Well, we know that God is transcendent above all creation. In Romans 1 through 3 again, uh, or excuse me, Genesis 1 through 3, Romans 1, Acts 17, a wonderful portion of scripture, describing how God is distinct from his creation. He is not uh, one with the universe, but the creator of the universe. So panentheism is a false doctrine, a deceitful doctrine. What about shamanism? We know shamanism is condemned in scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, 10 through 11, in 2 Chronicles 33, 6, in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, divination, sorcery, necromancy, and witchcraft, and other occult practices are condemned. Divination is where you're going to somebody and they're looking in a crystal ball, much like Saul did with the witch of Endor. That's wrong. Don't do that. That's not God's. It's condemned in Scripture. Sorcery is the use of herbs or other uh, pharmaceutical type uh, products to get into altered states of consciousness and to try to make contact with the spiritual realm. Same with necromancy, talking to the dead. So all of these things, all the practices of the shaman, the witch, or the neo-pagan that attempt to make contact with the unseen world, those things are condemned in Scripture. And we know that there really is one mediator between God and man. We don't need to go to a shaman. We need to come to Christ and believe in who he is and what he did on the cross for us. We don't have to go through an elaborate ritual to talk to God, but we can boldly approach the throne of grace because of who we are now in Christ. So we, don't, we know that shamanism and these practices are condemned in Scripture. What about relativism? Well, we know that the Bible says there is an absolute truth. That's the word of God. John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. That Jesus came to bear witness of the truth, according to John 18, verse 37. And Jesus himself said that he is the truth in John 14, 6. That's the last point there is supposed to be John 14, 6. Here's the verse for you and where I'd like to end this study. As we've been looking into the dark and at these deceitful doctrines of demons and how we ought to avoid them and how we hopefully are now better equipped to understand the neo-pagan or the witch, we can come to them with the truth. We can come to them with Jesus and the gospel. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You cannot get to heaven through neo-paganism or witchcraft. You can only get to heaven you can only be the true person that you were meant to be by entering into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. With that in mind, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be done. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for who you are and what you've done and how you're the one truly at work behind the scenes. You know all things. And I pray that you could use this study to equip us to be better ambassadors of your word to the witch and the neo-pagan, but you'd also warn us uh, that we could avoid and reject the teachings of neo-paganism and witchcraft that we find in our society. Pray that you'd help us and empower us to share the gospel with boldness, but with uh, consideration and respect as we have opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.